The Wasp Factory, Ian Banks' 1984 debut novel, is a compelling piece of transgressive literature that explores the darker crevices of the human mind, pinned with a masterful touch by an author who was wholly unafraid to challenge his readers. This book is, frankly, quite grim and is littered with content that many readers will find difficult to stomach as it digs into the darkness of themes like the morality of brutality, isolation and alienation, dysfunctional family dynamics, power, control and deception, and perception versus reality. Banks is a true master of his craft, and he handles these themes with an admirable finesse. But the Wasp Factory is nonetheless not for the faint of heart. The book revolves around the life of Frank Caldheim, a peculiar 16-year-old living on a small, remote Scottish island. And this Physical isolation mirrors Frank's emotional and psychological detachment from society. Frank is very much not your typical teenager. He is a deeply disturbed and vengeful kid with a history of violence. To date, Frank has committed three murders, the victims all being very young family members, and he considers these to be pivotal events in his life, though he does state that he doesn't intend to ever commit murder again and that he was just going through a phase. Over the course of the novel, Frank recounts for us the disconcerting details of these murders, each one alarming in its own unique way made even more excruciating by the young age of the victims. Frank lives with his eccentric father, who has his own set of bizarre rules and secrets, including withholding from Frank what turns out to be positively crucial information regarding Frank's own past. The book is sort of constructed upon Frank's ritualistic and macabre activities, such as his operation of the titular wasp factory, which is a homemade device that Frank uses to, he believes, predict the future by torturing wasps in various ways from burning them alive with candles to drowning them in his own urine. Frank's world is one of alienation, physically, mentally, emotionally, and the narrative is brimming with the troubling and gruesome details of Frank's thoughts and actions. His only friend is a dwarf named Jamie, with whom he semi-regularly drinks to excess, much to his father's chagrin. The plot really takes off when Frank's brother Eric, who is mentally unstable and has his own history of violent behavior, escapes from a psychiatric hospital. Throughout the book, Frank receives distressing phone calls from Eric, who seems to be slowly making his way toward the island while leaving a wake of chaos behind him. This impending reunion serves as both an early promise to the reader as well as a catalyst for the unraveling of these deeper familial secrets culminating in Frank's confrontation with his past and his own identity. In what may be arguably the single most upsetting scene in the entire book, it is revealed fairly late in the novel exactly why Frank's brother Eric is as disturbed as he is. And while Banks skillfully handles this incredibly bleak scene, it will undoubtedly trigger many sensitive readers.
The novel concludes with a shocking revelation about Frank and the nature of the events that shaped his life. It's a twist that forces both Frank and the reader to reevaluate everything that has transpired up to that point. Casting a new light on the narrative and challenging any and all notions about identity, gender, and normalcy. Banks's talent really shines through in his ability to make such a disturbing story not only enthralling, but also strangely funny. His signature dark wit is laced throughout the book, and this interplay of humor amidst the grimness provides a fitting and welcome contrast to the macabre themes, as well as showcases Banks's unique style that he would later become known for. One of the most intriguing aspects of the novel for me was the potentially unreliable narration provided by Frank. As I progressed through the story, especially after reading about Frank's account of his second murder, which contained many similar unlikely coincidences to the first, a hypothesis began to form in my mind. It seemed possible that these so-called murders were not actually orchestrated killings, but rather tragic accidents that Frank, in his quest for control in a life where he has none, claimed as his own doing. This interpretation provides an additional layer of complexity to the narrative, suggesting that Frank's actions might be a twisted means of asserting control where he feels powerless. Upon completing the novel, I do believe this hypothesis still holds some weight. Banks cleverly introduces just enough ambiguity to leave room for such an interpretation, though admittedly this viewpoint is not widely recognized in other reviews I've come across. At its core, The Wasp Factory is a story about self-discovery and the complex nature of identity. Frank's casual recounting of his murders and his ritualistic violence call into question the boundaries of morality and the origins of his violent tendencies. This theme is critical in understanding the worrisome aspects of Frank's character and the environment that shaped him. The struggle for control and power is a recurring motif, reflecting Frank's need to assert dominance in a life filled with uncertainties and hidden truths. Banks's skillful handling of these difficult subjects makes The Wasp Factory a powerful debut and a lasting contribution to the annals of transgressive literature. This is a book that finds itself on many most disturbing books lists, and whether or not it is deserving of that kind of accolade is neither here nor there, but the fact that it manages to be fantastically readable despite its potentially triggering content is a real testament to Banks's ability to provoke thought and weave a compelling narrative through grim and challenging subject matter. And I highly recommend this book to brave readers. So being such a huge fan of Ian M. Banks's science fiction work in the back half of 2023, I began a literary journey to read everything the man ever wrote. That journey began with the Wasp Factory. And so moving on in publication order, the next one I picked up was his 1985 sophomore effort, Walking on Glass. 
if the Wasp Factory is a mean-spirited game of mousetrap, then Walking on Glass is a confusing yet enjoyable multi-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. From the outset, the novel draws you in with three distinct narrative threads, each one crafted with fastidious attention to detail. The first thread follows Graham Park, a young artist living in modern day London, who falls in love with one Sarah Fitch, a complex woman who is cagey, non-committal, intellectual, and independent. This love story seems somewhat ordinary at first, but it is fraught with subtle oddities and this pervasive sense of impending disaster. Graham is naive and lost and over-eager, and these characteristics make his experiences and perceptions particularly poignant. The second thread follows Stephen Grout, a paranoid individual who believes he's actually a deposed intergalactic emperor who is living in exile on Earth. His story is filled with a mix of delusion and reality, which creates a surreal experience. Grout navigates the mundane world with a mindset that is consistently at odds with the reality he perceives, which leads to various conflicts and misunderstandings that would otherwise be completely avoidable. The final and perhaps most interesting yet confusing thread revolves around Quiss, a warrior trapped in a castle in the distant future who, as penance for an unspecified crime, is forced to play impossible games in order to solve the riddle, what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. This segment of the novel is filled with fantastical elements and metaphysical puzzles such as one-dimensional chess, open plan go on an infinite board and spotless dominoes. And this contrasts sharply with the more grounded and realistic narratives of Stephen and Graham. As the novel progresses, these three seemingly unrelated stories begin to converge in strange and totally unexpected ways. True to form, Banks delivers this absolutely stunning twist in the novel's climax, and his ability to shock remains, for me, unparalleled. In Walking on Glass, Banks explores themes of unrequited love, the thin line between sanity and madness, and like the Wasp Factory, the disparities between our perceptions and reality. The novel delves into the complexities of love and obsession, particularly in Graham's storyline, and Banks uses this narrative thread to examine how quickly love can border on obsession and how this intense emotion can lead to a loss of self and the distortion of reality. In all three plot threads, the book has moments where the lines between sanity and madness are blurred. And through these characters, Banks explores the idea that what might be considered perfectly sane in one context might be viewed as insane in another and vice versa. Perhaps the most prevalent theme of the novel is the divergence of perception from reality. Banks challenges the reader to question what is real and what is imagined. Through Stephen Grout, who believes he's really a once overthrown intergalactic emperor, through Quiss, 
who is trapped in this otherworldly castle at the end of time, and through Graham, whose budding romance is neither what he wishes it to be, nor what it appears to be. This theme strikes me as a commentary on the subjective nature of reality and how individual experience and mental state can alter one's perception of the world. What struck me most about Walking on Glass was its denouement as the final piece of this narrative puzzle falls into place. It creates this sort of literary Ouroboros, reminiscent of a more coherent Finnegan's Wake in its circular structure, yet wholly unique in its setup and payoff. It's an ending that prompts deep contemplation and demands a reread in order to unravel the book's many layered nuances. Walking on Glass is not a straightforward narrative. It demands attention and reflection, and it rewards readers who are willing to engage with its complexities and attempt to solve its puzzle. For fans of Banks and for readers seeking a novel that combines intricate plotting with deep thematic exploration, Walking on Glass is a masterful blend of both and stands as a remarkable piece in Banks's oeuvre. Have you read The Wasp Factory or Walking on Glass? If so, what are your thoughts? Let me know down below. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. A new video every week. I'll see you in the next one.